Say, uh, mom, can you get out? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, mom, just go sit in the waiting room. I'll be. I'll, we'll get you in a few minutes. Yeah. Would you say to the yeah, the daughter. I could send the daughter back out and talk to mom and coach mom on on not correcting the daughter and just listening and what she needs. Absolutely. What was the question? Yeah, I always part of the orienting to treatment. I say, you know, uh, you know, this is family therapy, but at the same time, you know, there there are two of you, and so sometimes one of you has to work on something without the other person present. Okay, and I said, you know, it's not that we're going to have secrets about it, but it, I mean, you know. You'll know what's going on, more or less, because you know whatever I'm doing with you when the other person's not here is the same thing I'm doing with the other one when you're not here. You know. Usually I'll make the decision, but usually if they both need work, I'll say who wants to leave first. I mean that's fine. I don't. It doesn't really matter. Like in this case, I actually would probably give them the choice because I got to work on this one with the accurate expression and the other one with the, the not interrupting, actually being open-minded, listening, you know, trying to get it. So there's usually time to work on both. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it's 90% with the whole family in the room and sometimes for a long time it's 10% with them both in the room and 90% is individually but it's they're on relational targets. Notice we're still working, I don't want to oversimplify, but we're still working on the same basic two steps. Accurate expression and validation. You know. Now of course underneath each of those steps is emotion self-management or staying regulated. That's behind accurate expression and behind validation. Mindfulness is behind emotion regulation. So it's mindfulness, Emotion regulation, accurate expression, mindfulness, relationship mindfulness, emotion regulation, validation. So there, there's a, a whole train of skills there, but they culminate in accurate expression and validation. That's the part that's public. On a chain, a healthy chain, the colored in circles, right, the colored in circles, if this was a healthy chain, instead of ending up with suicide attempt, if this ended up with you know, something decent, the colored in circles would be either accurate expression or validation. The empty circles would be mindfulness, emotion regulation, skills, relationship mindfulness, you know, those kinds of things, which lead to the ability to express accurately or validate. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to let you say this in the microphone because I'm not going to repeat it. Okay. I'm saying that I think there's a catch with the validation process that just uh, occurred to me that uh, when you validate someone, you deny the opportunity for them to have a good fight with you. And when you have such intense right. emotions... That's like denying somebody the opportunity to shoot up heroin. Right, and this right. is ten times more gratifying to fight and, and take it out. Well, in the short term, it's more gratifying to shoot up heroin. But in the long time, it's more gratifying to have a decent life, <laughs> right? And that's what I'm banking on. I'm banking on I am interrupting a, a, a very overlearned pattern that works in a very small way and trying to substitute a much harder pattern that won't work for a while. So you're absolutely right. But I don't ever want us to think that I'm actually depriving them of something that in their heart they would prefer. Your average heroin addict, at least the ones I've known, I've known a bunch of them, in their heart does not want to be a heroin addict. Except the moments when they want to be a heroin addict, which is that 10 minutes or two hours before they use. But then at other points in their life, they don't want to use, right? Anybody ever try to quit smoking? Anybody ever try to do that, right? Right, every day, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what ha happens every other, day. every other day, right. And so, I, I mean, I've never smoked, so I, 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 but I'm told, you know, that the idea is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, when you're not having nicotine withdrawal, you don't want to smoke. I'm not saying everybody wants to quit, but if you want to quit, that you want to quit. That's like, we, in DBT, we call wise mind. That's what I, my heart of hearts, I want to quit, except when I don't which is when I have the urge and I can't stand the experience and maybe I'm stressed and maybe I'm having some nicotine withdrawals, right? 
So, so in DBT, we, we actually make this distinction. We say this, this balanced long-term view is wise. That's the wise mind view, the wise mind goals, if you will. Okay. But that doesn't mean that you can't have short-term goals that are emotion mind. Like I, I can't stand it. Okay? Like I want to stick the needle in my arm or I want to smoke again or I want to have the argument again. Want to. That's a, want is not always long-term want. Want is sometimes immediate, I can't stand it kind of want. Okay? And of course we're trying to help people stand it to try the new thing so that eventually the new thing works almost as well as the old thing in the short term and a lot better in the long term. You know? Now, m people I know who've been heroin addicts will often say, most of them do say, there's never anything quite as lovely as that first heroin rush. Now, I'm not advocating this. I've never been a heroin addict, so I don't know. But they say that's really a, a euphoric experience and, and chasing it destroys your life. Okay? The, the, Right? You've, you've probably heard this sort of thing, right? So, so yeah, there might be something satisfying about winning a, a nasty argument or even being in a nasty argument, but there's probably something much more deeply satisfying about not needing the argument, about being close and feeling secure in that and acting in ways that are decent and consistent with your goals and values so that, you know, and if you've ever been in a decent relationship for you know, months, not have to be years, but months. I, I mean, I don't think at the end of a couple of weeks you say, you know what, I haven't had a good fight in a while. I really feel like just messing up my relationship. Nobody does that, right? You say, wow, this is great. And then something happens and you have a fight. But the fight is, it's not, that's not the goal. It's not in the heart to have that, you know? Now, that doesn't mean that you might not want excitement, but there are other ways to get excitement be besides being nasty. You know, there really are other ways to be excited. If you don't, can't, we'll work on your imagination, okay? <laughs> and I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yes, I'm still wondering with some, yeah. where's the motivation? How do you get them to be motivated towards that goal? Right. Especially well, that's, children. that's a, in DBT, we say the skill for motivation towards that goal is awareness of your long term goals. Always, right? That's why I keep saying get the people to keep reminding it's almost a practice like, wait a minute, before I open my mouth, this is somebody I love. That's very changing. It's very hard to have the same edge of nastiness if you're remembering this is somebody I love. So you big jerk comes out as I'm so frustrated with you. Well, I'm so frustrated with you is really not a toxic thing to say to your partner or your child or your parent. It's not. You big jerk is kind of toxic. I'm so frustrated, gets, if the other person is similarly inclined, wait a minute, this is somebody I love, wait a minute, what, you're frustrated, how come? What, ha what did I do? Now, that sounds like a conversation. I'm not saying it's an easy one, but it sounds like a conversation. It doesn't sound like a mutual attack. Um, and I think when people do that successfully, I, I, most people wouldn't choose to do it the old way. They don't. People don't achieve success and they say at the end of therapy, you know what, this was nice, but I think we're going to go back to our old way. People don't do that. They sometimes slide back, but they, they hate that. They don't like it. They prefer not to. It's not easy, though. Change is hard. Yeah? What's your, what do you think about the fact that the incident of uh, Taking drugs and alcohol yeah. actually increases and increases even in Israel. And the United States, if I'm not wrong, one, 10% are taking already uh, something against uh, depression, especially the ISIS drug. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what do you take? Yeah, so the question is, like, wh wh why so many people taking drugs? I can tell you for sure, mm -hmm. because I did some statistics, one of 50 women in Israel, in general, I yeah. think, which they are delivering a baby, which they are pregnant, yeah. they take something antidepressant and a ben a benzodiazepine. Yeah. They wouldn't tell it to the doctor. Yeah. So why is it? 
Is it because our uh, dynamic yeah. life? Yeah, so he's asking me a question like, like why is the world falling apart? <laughs> right? OK. Uh, and that's my answer. OK. I mean, of course, I could, I could ex I, and I actually would, would mean it, but I don't think you should take me as an expert on an answer to that. I th you know, of course, I think that, that you know, the, the very short answer that I would give is that we've become worse and worse at this, at being connected in real ways, and we're substituting more and more immediate escape from, un from discomfort. And we have a lot of a lot of help, at least in America, we have a lot of help from pharmaceutical companies telling us that we should never feel uncomfortable. Unco take a pill for that. You know, we've, we've pathologized ordinary human suffering, the ordinary, necessary part of human suffering. And I think once we pathologize ordinary suffering, then we start to do dysfunctional things to handle even ordinary suffering. Uh, so, but that's my, I'm not an expert on that. That's just my soapbox. So I don't know if that's right. But that's what I think. Yeah. Can you say what you meant by that? Yeah, uh, so, so the question was at the bottom of the uh, skill slide, or the other, one of the things I mentioned was parenting. No, sometimes, um, sometimes parents come in who really don't have good ordinary parenting skills. Um, you know, Baumrind and others, you know, spent you know 50, the last 50 years trying to look at what what goes into reasonably raising reasonably healthy kids, and they come up with what what I think they call now they call balanced parenting. Are you all familiar with this research? There's literally hundreds of studies. Diane Baumrind started it in the 60s and 70s, and basically she's the one that, that came up with the idea that there could be permissive parenting, which is a lot of nurturance but no limit setting, and there could also be um, uh, author authoritarian parenting, which is strict discipline but not much nurturing. Okay, and then of course the idea is that healthy kids mostly come out of having parents who do both things. They're very good at setting limits and very good at nurturing. They do actually both parts. So we talk, and it actually of course fits in perfectly to a dialectical approach. To this is acceptance and change. We have to not let kids do things that are developmentally problematic, but we've got to provide them lots of love as well. And uh, so we, we certainly teach ordinary parenting skills to parents who don't have them. Lots of our parents have good parenting skills when they're regulated. And so helping them stay regulated is all they need. Other parents, even when they're regulated, don't have good parenting skills. You know, they can't stand, I mean, I'm thinking of a mom that I'm working with right now. I mean, she cannot stand seeing her daughter have any suffering. And so what she does, anytime the child, you know, this teenager, you know, she's just, a little anxious about like she's going to go out with a new friend. She's a little anxious. I mean, the mom is just way too. I mean, it's a combination of over control and not setting limits and providing nurturance in situations that nurturance is not really the right thing, you know. And so she really needs to 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 learn some parenting and to regulate herself both. Um, that's just an example. You know. And sometimes we have parents who are very authoritarian, and you know, well, you know. She should know I love her. I, you know, if I didn't love her, I wouldn't care what time she comes home. Well, you know, it might help to tell her, you know, or him. 